All right. So welcome everybody to the uh, July 4th meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. My name is Brian McCullough. I'm the meeting chair and the host. I feel like a cruise director for the love boat or something here, but here we go. So we've got some interesting uh, things on this evening. Everybody all settled there in the back? Alrighty. Here's the lineup for tonight. Okay, our, our regular segment with Tim Cole on Ottawa Skies, what's visible uh, this coming up this month. Uh, Rob Dick has an item from the uh, General Assembly in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, we've got, we all have another couple of announcements on the go there. Uh, Richard Alexandrovich communi communicating with ET. All right, and I think we're going to have something, a little bit of an ET theme that carries on. It'll be somebody doesn't know about this yet, so we'll, we'll surprise him. Uh, Eric Benson's in tonight uh, with some uh, spectroscopy and imaging that he's done from his, uh, uh, it's Huntley Ridge, eh, Eric? Yeah. Right, so Huntley Ridge Observatory. Oh, it's, of course it's right there. Uh, Rolf Meyer uh, is going to give us an announcement about a, uh, a lunar and planetary imaging workshop. He's going to be, uh, uh, he and Linda will be hosting at their, uh, their house on the Upper Dwyer Hill Road. And our regular segments at the end of observations, so we'll have people's uh, observations from the, uh, the past, uh, the non-rainy nights. And uh, some interesting observing challenges uh, this evening. All right, so let's, uh, let's get underway. The first thing is, did everybody receive a copy of uh, Sky News with their, uh, with their membership? All right, we have, uh, it's very interesting uh, this, uh, in this issue because we have three Ottawa Centre members uh, who have uh, items in, the, uh, in, in Sky News. All right, let's go to next one. All right. So first up, uh, we've got Glenn Ledru. Uh, he's got a very interesting article on the uh, on our spiral arm of the of the Milky Way. That's in there. Uh, next up, Rob Dick on developing a dark sky strategy. Uh, quite interesting uh, reading there. And also uh, an item from uh, Rolf Meyer, who will be uh, who's going to be hosting the imaging uh, workshop that I just mentioned. And he's got a letter to the editor in there. So uh, a good haul eh, from the uh, from the Ottawa Centre. So uh, well done, guys. Well done. Okay, and uh, Barry, Barry Matthews. Uh, good evening, all. It's uh, a little bit different different for me to be up on this end of the, the podium, but um, when I was at the GA, um, the uh, Historical Committee, which I'm chair of, the National Historical Committee, um, and, and I should say it's corrected now, it's History con Committee because they've combined the library committee and the historical committee uh, at the national level. Anyway, um, one of our members of the, um, of the, uh, of the committee um, put together 140 years of art and observation. And this was put together as a poster, um, a, a multi uh, faucet po poster with uh, a number of uh, eight by ten um, replicas of documents and drawings that we have in the National Archives of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, this comes with a catalog, uh, catalog and describing uh, these uh, items and um, we are making this poster set up um, available to anybody, um, any member of the RASC that wants to have it up at a star party or uh, in, a mu in a museum or uh, set up for um, uh, Cubs or Scouts or something like that or by on, on loan to various centers across, uh, across Canada. I would encourage, it's, uh, it's a, quite a write-up because uh, what he was looking, uh, Randall um, Rosenfeld was looking for is the fact that before cameras, before anything else did, uh, other than the telescope, people all did sketches. They did sketches of solar flares, they did sketches of um, of uh, the moon, they did, you know, that was the only way they could record it. And uh, Randall has really captured some of the uh, very best of these uh, posters, and like I say, they're available. Um, just a, sh a short note on something else. Um, the Historical Committee is actually um, going to each center and asking the centers to 
um, produce a um, through through uh, myself or what any one of the members uh, send pictures in of their own observatory a w brief description no absolute um, location where it where it is um, a brief description of of what's in it um, some of the things that you had trouble um, uh, developing your own observatory and this will be put on a CD and stored in the national office as part of the historical archives of the Royal Astronomical Society. And there will be one CD pr produced for each of the 30 uh, centers for, from uh, across Canada. So as a pilot project, I'm asking the members of the Ottawa Centre to send me pictures with a brief description of your observatory. Um, and one of the things that we would like to on it, and this has a, got a very funny um, uh, uh, effect, um, if they put the lat and long, uh, latitude and longitude of their observatory on, on, on this disk, this disk will eventually go into the Department of Transport and they will take into consideration if they're going to put um, a road alongside of your observatory or some other shopping center. They will think about it. Not saying they, they will not use it, but um, I, you all can get my email address out of the uh, uh, members list on the uh, thing and there will be a note about um, about this talk um, both in the next issue of um, astronauts thank you very much hi just got back from the GA it was great uh, Barry and I and uh, a bunch of us were there uh, and this was my highlight uh, Richard <laughs> Richard met uh, uh, Phil and the uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson at uh, Las Vegas just a little while ago, so I had to uh, rub it in. But uh, this was our uh, highlight here. Uh, if you don't know Phil Plate, he's the uh, author of Bad Astronomy. He's a um, physics uh, P or astronomer PhD, and he's wrote a few books on uh, uh, debunking myths about astronomy and so on. Excellent, excellent speaker. He talked to us about how seven ways a black hole can kill you and uh, other interesting things. <laughs> And this other guy happened to be there as well. Uh, Peter, are you here tonight? That's Peter Servalo. Anyway, uh, it was one of my highlights of uh, meeting uh, Phil. Uh, very, very approachable, Phil was. Okay, first one. So on to our question, speaking of Toronto. First of all, the rules. Um, if you think you have the answer, <clears throat> talk to me at the break. No fear Goog no, uh, fair Googling. Actually, Googling probably won't help you on this one. So, speaking of the Toronto GA, I have to confess I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does the Toronto Maple Leafs have to do with astronomy? Hmm, okay. Well, uh, so, this is uh, the uh, second last gas giant that we have in our solar system. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. But this is your. <laughs> anyway, getting back to our subject here. <laughs> it's astronomy. It's astronomy. This is astronomy. Okay, first of all, the answer is not they are the same color, and it has nothing to do with the name of that planet. <laughs> So, if you think you have the answer, and you do get it, the prize tonight is the, um, the DVD that Eric made for us of the RASC annual dinner speak, uh, featuring uh, Chris Jones, the author of Too Far From Home. It was an excellent talk, and the CD's up for grabs if you got the right answer. So, what do the Toronto Maple Leafs have in common with that planet? <laughs> uh, all right, so next up, uh, Tim Cole with a, a view of to what's coming up in the uh, skies this coming month. There will be some stars. There will be some planets. 
the clouds. <laughs> At the same time? Not necessarily. Um, oh yeah. Now, Brian and Chris did all kinds of horrible things. Um, actually, even starting tonight, there's some really cool juxtapositions. Juxtaposition, yeah, good, good Scrabble word. That'll wipe your opponents out forever. Um, Regulus, if you don't know what Regulus is, too bad. Um, Mars, Saturn, and a real pretty crescent moon. And the really fun part is Mars is zipping around like crazy right at the moment. So uh, they couldn't decide which of my fabulous pieces of Starry Night artwork to use. So here's a little animation, which they didn't like the first time, the miserable wretches. But it really shows. You can see which one is Mars and which one is Saturn. This is a the careful reader will note sort of thing. Um, ah, jeez. You're not a careful reader. You try to point out now. There you go. There's Mars. There's Mars. There's Saturn. And the one that isn't moving is Regulus. And the one that's blinking at you is the moon. So you've just been chucked a moon. Now, this one is the... Um, the larger view uh, going from today actually to the 8th and uh, what you see is a, quite a gentle motion. Now the thing is is I have this keyed to the ground so this would be looking in the same direction actually uh, southwest and central park is the uh, image. Uh, nobody was mugged in the making of this illustration. Um, so basically we have some fun stuff happening for the next few days. We have some excellent uh, overflights coming up for the International Space Station. Um, I put two of these in here. We've got a very, this is a very, very long one. And uh, one of the fun parts is we'll see the space station right near the Pleiades if the uh, ground cover happens to uh, allow you. Um, and what I also threw in, an hour and a half later, you have another one, but on the com you know, complete opposite side of the sky. So uh, the space station's always fun because it's incredibly bright and the brightness varies tremendously depending on the orientation of the solar panels and such like. So uh, always good fun if you feel like staying up at ridiculous hours of the morning. Um, Jupiter's at opposition, big whoop. Um, it's just a tiny bit brighter than it used to be. For anyone who's not certain, what's happening there is that the Sun and the Earth and Jupiter are in dead line. So it is theoretically at its brightest, not that there's a tremendous difference. Um, and I threw in a couple of little things, some fun stuff to do in the light polluted suburbs. Uh, these are actually inspired by the binocular highlights book from Sky and Tell. Um, M39 is a cute little cluster. It's really easy to find. This is a nice little bino cluster. So if you're out in the lawn chair with a pair of 10 by 50s, it's a fun one to look at. And uh, just opposite on the, on the other end of Cygnus is a, another cute little thing that I think most people have stumbled into if you do any binocular uh, hunting from the lawn chair. And it is known as Brachi's clutcher, a cluster, even though it's not a cluster. Uh, the more affectionate term is the coat hanger, which I rather enjoy. There's your up-close picture of it. Uh, it's actually cataloged as a cluster in some catalogs, but it's not. It's just a chance alignment of stars that looks exactly like an upside-down pant hanger. There's the pant hanger upside down, and there's the, the head of it. So your pants are actually being wrinkled. Uh, they're now falling off the closet. Um, either that or it's just before you tug them off which is what I usually do and my wife usually yells at me and says, why are you doing that? You're ruining your pants and never mind. Okay, so there you go. Some fun stuff for this. Uh... Now, of course, since we had 22 days of rain in June and somewhat more days of cloud, um, whether you get a chance to see any of this is up for grabs. Uh, we're all photon deprived, so we'll have to see what happens. Oh yes, I forgot, I put in a little circle. Ain't I cute? Okay. And that's more than likely what you're going to see. <laughs> there's, the, uh, there's the pointer here. Okay. I'll just put the pointer. I'll, uh, All feel, right. I'll, I'll, I'll do the cues. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Well, several months ago, um, I was talking about humanity's endeavors to uh, locate life in the cosmos, any type of life, primitive or advanced. But tonight, we are going to go into more of a, uh, I guess, a sequel or part two in our continuing saga of life in the universe. Um, we're going to talk about our chances of establishing some form of contact um, with a technology or with a, an advanced uh, cultural society. Uh, first of all, there are um, two scenarios. Next. Um, attempting interstellar travel. Well, in this day and age, it's highly unrealistic. We'll have to wait a while. 
Uh, there's an adequate technology and there's a lack of funding. Um, Bernard Oliver, uh, former chief of uh, NASA's uh, SETI, now defunct SETI program, states that, and I quote, the energy cost of a single one-way trip to a stellar system about 10 light years away that uses a ship wasting no energy that is the perfect spaceship would require 500,000 years worth of the total energy consumption of the entire planet. Now, this would be bad for the green, green people and those who are <laughs> environmentally <laughs> conscious. A lot of naysayers there. But uh, the costs would be enormous, to say the least, and present-day propulsion systems would simply be far from inadequate. They would be just too primitive. Uh, next, please. Now, if we could make a ship travel a thousand times faster than the speeds that we travel today, which is about 28,000 uh, miles per hour for the space shuttle orbiting the Earth, it would take our astronauts 11,000 years to reach a star 60 light years away. Now, Voyager 1, the most distant human-made object, is now at a distance of 8.4 billion miles from the sun. That's about 90 astronomical units. At its current speed, it travels about 3.6 astronomical units per year. And don't forget, the uh, Voyager was launched and boosted from the Earth back in 1977. The Kuiper Belt is about 200 astronomical units and Alpha Centauri is 260,000 astronomical units. So you can see even the closest star, there's an immense vastness, immense gulf of space. It's going to be a hell of a long time for its arrival at that system. So we can forget about it for now. Science will definitely need to develop small payloads and ultralight propulsion systems. Now, another example is to send a one pound, uh, uh, one pound um, group of mass to the next star in 40 years, a one pound mass of anything, you would need about 50 kilotons of explosives to get the pound up to speed required to get that pound up there in, in 40 years. Now the idea is possible, but humanity would have to wait for several centuries. Other things to consider. Next, please. Space vessels of the future would, send to, would need to have rather colonies that would pass information off to their offspring, a type of micro-environment mimicking conditions here on Earth. What you have over there is a Stanford Taurus uh, agriculture layout. In space, the advantages of space is that one of the uh, activities, such as agri agriculture, can be easily controlled. Of course, these uh, rotating platforms ro would rotate about two times a minute to simulate the gravity of Earth. But we're looking at about, you know, five to a thousand years into the future. But still, something for food for thought. Next, please. Now, as far as robots, robotics are concerned, there will be a day when the silicon chip will replace the archaic carbon unit. Computer brains will be the next step in our evolution. There is much more storage space for knowledge and information, and the potential for growth would be unlimited. Now, this type of technology will overcome time constraints and exploit um, the long-term space travel environment. There is, uh, what you see there is the lead hardware engineer, Susan Young Lee, with a rover that they called K-10, and these, uh, these types of units are going to be used to do the risky jobs of humans when they land on other worlds. The Mars rover is one example, and later on they'll be, they'll be developing more, more complicated types of machinery. Uh, some scientists even go as far as saying that in about 30 years, computers will actually carry out the thought process of the human being. Uh, the, com uh, the computer and human will um, actually interact with one another and there will be this symbiotic relationship. And uh, this will be good for long-term space voyages. Next, please. If the ultimate propulsion system falls short a notch, we could place our intrepid space travelers in a type of a deep freeze. Uh, similar to movie settings uh, in the movie uh, 2001 or Alien, this one was from Alien, I think, humans can lower their metabolic rates and hibernate while they travel to another star system. Now, hopefully, this time, the onboard computers will not jeopardize the scene and kill the lives of the astronauts as it was in 2001. The sober part of all this is that our interstellar travelers of the distant future will venture to the stars, but they will not return back to Earth. There will be no welcome back ticker tape parade back on terra firma. Next, please. 
Now, even if they do manage to come back many generations later, the normal path of our evolution would have taken its toll. Language and culture, among other things, would evolve as well as communication. And what about our space travelers? How would they appear to humans back on Earth? Well, that's uh, anyone's guess. That's very hard to tell. Now, having said this, taking into account today's levels of technology, we must then consider our second scenario something that would make more sense in today's society, a method that is both much more cost-effective and easier to achieve. Next, please. Here we either listen or send messages to our distant friends or foes. Our tool of choice, microwave communications. Microwaves are proven to be very efficient. They, um, they are found between on the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Sorry, I don't have a picture of that. Um, they are found between the radio and infrared uh, radio waves at one gigahertz, and their length is approximately one meter. Now, they can travel through our atmosphere unimpeded and are least likely to be absorbed by the ISM or the interstellar medium. Now, the thing is, a two-way conversation is not that crucial. Setting up a one-way link, whether it's only to transmit or to be on the receiving end would be just as effective. And you may ask why. Interstellar space is, you know, so immense. It's very large. It would take aeons waiting for a response to come back. And contact from either party would tell them or us that there are at least two planets in our galaxy with advanced societies, at least in one galaxy, the Milky Way. The late Carl Sagan once said, next please, that the message that was sent to M13 deliberately in 1974 was just logically a waste of time. Here we would take an example, about 22,000 light years M13 is. It would take 23,000 light years for electromagnetic signals to reach potential inhabitants out there to receive our message of goodwill and then roughly another 23,000 light years for the return serve back to Earth. That's 46,000 years, if my math is correct to wait for electromagnetic signals to reach our ears. Plus, there's no guarantee the signals will ever reach our solar system. Furthermore, will humanity still be around to receive the goods? That's another big question. Barring a natural catastrophe or complete annihilation through nuclear warfare, how will humans interpret or decipher an alien message? And a globular is not exactly the best place or best target to send a message. There are too many gravitational instabilities among its stellar members. Stars are basically too close to each other, basically about one light year or so away. Planets would find it difficult to survive in this crowded star field. Next, please. A better place, uh, I feel, would, uh, and some of you would agree, would be to transmit our existence to an open cluster. Open clusters are generally much closer to home, several thousand light years away. And they are lying in the spiral arms of our galaxy where life is most likely to take a foothold. Now, don't forget, our sun is part of an evolving open cluster. So, and a lot of stars there are of various members. There are um, AO stars, B stars, G stars, which our sun happens to be, and why not there? Receiving or waiting for something to come in would be difficult as well. We need to ask ourselves which stellar system is most likely to send a message. We know that not all stars will harbor a twin Earth, and especially the unstable stars and those with tenuous gas and dust disks. We now know that red dwarfs are not that good for forming planets because the dust disks are extremely thin out there. Now, what frequency will they be using? Next, please. What channel or channels will ET be using as well? How wide will their messages be? Will they be broadcasting or narrowcasting? Our receiving equipment must meet the standards of sensitivity as well as pointing in the right direction at the right time. We're beginning to talk about a crap shot, a game of chance or luck, a cosmic lottery game. Another hurdle, the scintillating effect caused by the interstellar medium. Next, please. I like this picture when I was doing the research. It reminds me of a clamshell opening up and the jewels inside blazing forth. 
the uh, propagating radio waves on Earth, um, the um, scintillating effect, I'm using propagating radio waves on Earth as an example. Atmospheric conditions will cause them to fade in and out when you tune in radio stations at night. They don't always stay, those stations, they, they tend to fade out. The, a signal from either party would suffer the same consequences. Anything that happens to come between the sender and recipient may jeopardize the signal. What about our ability to decode a potential message, to recognize the signal when receivers on Earth pick them up? Is there any cosmic chatter out there? Do we need to separate it from cosmic noise? Now, our computers would select and, so and sift out these natural noises from ones that are artificial in nature. The receivers would be strategically located as well. Ideal coming, upcoming locations include the Australian outback, and the southern part of Africa. Sites are nearly free of human electronic uh, uh, interference in those areas. ET listeners don't have to uh, listen to spurious interference from cell phones, pagers, and other communication devices. Now, the far side of the moon is the ultimate location, but again, uh, there's a cost prohibitive, although some people swear that there is something on the, on the other side of the moon, but I won't comment on that. Now, there is virtually zero interference from anything on Earth on the far side of the moon, because simply the moon is blocking it. So there will be an excellent place to put receiving stations out there. Next, please. Now, the issue about language. Will ET communicate in a binary code or some other form of mathematics? Or will it be a simpler and straightforward jargon? Our best educated guesses tell us that they will resort to digital means. However, we're saying that today, in 100 years from now, it could be another, another method. However, naysayers will argue that the best way to transmit any signal would be to use simple carriers aloft on powerful beacons. When it comes to the crunch, your guess is as good as mine. Dickinson said that the likelihood of bumping into another civilization that is more or less at par with our society would be exceedingly small. Either they are very primitive or extremely advanced. Perhaps ET will give us a ring by employing more exotic means of communication. Their methods of choice? Well, they could exploit gravity waves, for instance, dark matter or even antimatter. They may be sending out signals as we speak, but the problem is that we just haven't had the time to locate or decode them, uh, these messages that are coming in. They may be going right by our planet without us knowing of it. Next, please. In 1960, it was Frank Drake who attempted humanity's first crack to try to eavesdrop on another civilization with an 85-foot radio antenna in Green Bank, Virginia. He called it Project Ozma, after the Queen of Oz, after the program The Wizard of Oz. Meticulously, he tuned into the star systems of Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani, about 11 light years away. Sadly, there were no results. But his pioneering work set the inspiration and determination for others around the world to seek out these signals from space. Currently, there are about 60 programs that are either, are either online or soon to be fired up for this great quest. We can listen to more channels while at the same time cover larger real estate in the sky. Next, please. Under construction is the Murchison Wide Field Array, or the MWA radio telescope. It will be built in the Australian outback. Aside from collating data about conditions in the infant universe, the MWA will listen for signals from pulsars, supernovae, and variable flare stars. Radio astronomers also hope that the MWA will be sensitive enough to detect brief unexpected phenomena artificial in origin. Some scientists remain very skeptical, however. The odds of stumbling across a truly alien signal would be extremely low. Now, if that isn't enough, next one, please. In the, well, not so distant future, the square kilometer array now on the drawing board, or SKA, its completion date will be around 2014. And this will up the ante for our search for ET. It will have 50 times the sensitivity of the VLA, or very large array, with one square kilometer of collecting area. There will be 150 stations with a collecting area equivalent to a 90 meter telescope, and 30 stations with a collecting area of a 200 meter telescope. 
and it will complement facilities operating at other wavelengths, such as the upcoming next generation James Webb Space Telescope. Now, detecting a signal from another stellar system would have a profound effect upon humanity. It will change the way we think and do things as a human species here on this planet. And I just hope that these changes will be positive and constructive. Because, after all, if we don't listen, we will never know for sure. Thank you. That's it. I have a question. There was a, um, there was a, I have a Yahoo was my, uh, my page on my website, and uh, there was this sort of little uh, I don't know, discussion about the Earth is in fact actually giving off a noise, which you can hear in space. Yeah. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, well, the only noise I could think of is the noise from all our um, electronic devices and toys. Like, we're giving off um, uh, electromagnetic signals galore. Um, like, if you've seen that movie, um, Contact, with Jodie Foster, it starts off with the, with the Earth and all the noise in the background. As, as you go further out into space, it gets less and less, although it wasn't as accurate as, as it's supposed to be. So, and also, there's, there's thermal radiation from the heat from the planet, from the greenhouse effect. There's a lot of things, uh, as, to my knowledge, that is being emitted by the Earth. And anyone with sensitive devices, uh, now that's another question, uh, depends what devices they're using, they could detect this so-called noise and communications. Now what they're after is leakage from radio signals such as um, like our equivalent to, uh, you've read about it in books uh, like talk radio and the I Love Lucy show. This, uh, as uh, Dickinson puts this bubble of babble is now 70 light years wide and anybody within this radius will be able to pick up this so-called noise. Glenn, did you have yeah, yep. a, a comment? Yeah, uh, You mentioned that uh, open clusters will be more favorable locations to uh, try to communicate with any EVs. Yep. Actually, for some of the same reasons, they're not as good uh, as, for instance, globulars, clusters because you've got a, an environment where you have uh, potential for interactions and uh, gravitational disturbances and so on. And moreover, most open clusters are rather on the young side. Uh, our solar system's been around for about five billion years, nearly. And we're only now having uh, intelligent life as we know it. Uh, most open clusters don't get much beyond about a hundred or a few hundred million years old before they begin to disrupt. And even the oldest ones are on the order of just maybe a few billion years themselves, but they're very scarce. Uh, and young clusters as well, of course, they might contain very hot ionizing stars, you know, with a lot of uh, potentially damaging Destroy. cloud radiation. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the most massive stars exploding every now and again as supernovae which would be you know, in one's backyard. So most open clusters really would not be particularly good candidates for those reasons that, more. That was a thought that I was uh, de deliberating on a few years ago, you know, like a globular, it's very tight, but uh, I realized that our, our sun, I think, is part of the Ursa Major open cluster, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's not a member of it. Uh, it's the Ursa Major cluster is only, at most, I think, a few hundred million years old, a fraction of the age of the sun. Our sun probably once was a member of a cluster, but we just can't identify any members because we've gone around the galaxy about 20 times. It just wandered in. Yeah, we're just passing through by chance. There's also other superclusters that we're passing through, like the Hyades, uh, the Pleiades, uh, and of course the Ursa Major group, which is part of the Sirius supercluster. Uh, but it's just an accidental you know, ch uh, chance, really, that we're in the same region of space. But the galaxy is full of all these dispersed old streams of stars uh, dismembered yeah dismembered clusters well they they're, they're starting the searches with stars that are very close sun like g type stars uh, 200 light years away but as the equipment gets better and better they'll go further and further and there'll be more stars under under table to look at so um, um, but yeah like you said there could be the oddball star that yeah single stars are the best candidates and ones that we know have been around for long time long enough for life to evolve to a, a sufficient degree yes I had a question. Yep. Now, our knowledge will increase through time, but I want to know, we, we have a finite amount of resources on the Earth, and even if you include the solar system, are there enough resources to send people out of the solar system to the next galaxy? You know, no matter how much time it takes, are the resources there? That's hard. That's a hard question to ask. We're just starting, like we're talking about next uh, next step on on Mars. But uh, to to send people beyond the solar system, that's going to be a very big step because it'll take a lot of 
time, energy, money to send someone um, to even Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away, and at this stage it'll take us, like, like I said earlier, generations, and that's going to involve a lot of work, a lot of energy, so I'm saying all this will probably happen in hundreds of years. We, we're just better still be happy with what we see from Earth, and, you know, because uh, right now it's on, it's on a borderline of, of fiction. <laughs> yes? Now, you, you paint a very grim, dark picture of ever visiting another solar system, and rightly so, the problems are huge. Now, what about the possibility, and I'm not interested in seeing little green men out there because I'm one of those that don't believe they exist out there, but just for the pure science of visiting another solar system, uh, scientists are working on superluminal uh, you know, space travel, and some scientists say that it is possible. We know that it happened at the beginning of the universe. Uh, do you have any other information about uh, uh, possible uh, travel at faster than the speed of light? Is, is any progress being made on that anywhere in the world? Uh, on, on that Frankly, I, I couldn't answer that question. I don't know any secret documents or anything like that, the superluminal. I've heard radio shows on it, but uh, I don't want to get into that <laughs> teleportation type thing. <laughs> Sorry. Any other comments or questions? All right, Richard, thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you. Oh, there I go. Did, it, did anybody get their answers to Chuck? No, not yet. Anybody, ha last call for answers? Nobody's got the right answer yet, and I didn't think they would. <laughs> Actually, Eric had a good idea because um, this is the uh, 400th anniversary of the start of Quebec, and um, what astronomical instrument did Champ whoop, Champlain have? Uh, there you go. <laughs> See, I told you everybody would know it. Can I make a guess? Okay. <laughs> You're stretching it. <laughs> My guess was it takes more years for the for Uranus to travel around the sun than it has been since the week. Yeah, the last time we went to Stanley Cup, the, you know, that, that's so good, it, but no. It no. Took long, you're saying it took yeah. longer for Uranus to travel around the sun. Did everybody catch the Herschel connection? Go, go ahead, Gary. From, from, oh, wait a second. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Wait, wait a second. Did everybody catch the Herschel connection? Who discovered Uranus? <laughs> Gary. Matt Sandin was born the same year Uranus was discovered. Matt Sandin. No. Uh, they're Uranus in second last place. Uranus yeah, yeah, we've, we've heard them all. Richard, both are detected only by their gravitational effects on You're close. <laughs> You're close. It has something to do with gravity. Okay. Lay it on us. Okay, next one, please. They've both fallen on their sides. You notice there's a... Notice there's a puck here. The Toronto Maple Leaf net seems to be a puck magnet. <laughs> Pucks always orbit around the Toronto Maple Leaf goal. It's almost like it has a gravitational force. Well, that second last gaseous planet also has a puck around it. <laughs> Everybody's going, oh. <clears throat> that puck. There. <laughs> Very good. There, nobody won it. There you go. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chuck. You're welcome. Oh, by the way, happy Aphelion Day. This morning, we were the furthest away from the sun in our orbit. You didn't know that, did you? Aphelion News. Happy Aphelion Day. Okay, so uh, introducing uh, Eric Benson, who's got uh, an interesting presentation here on uh, his uh, Huntley Ridge Observatory observations he's been making. Well, it's been a while since uh, it's up here, probably about more than 15 years, but uh, yeah, about that. I, was, I used to be an educator here, so I used to talk, it was usually uh, Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts, so a different crowd. Um, I, uh, I used to do visual uh, observing a lot, um, Len might remember that. You know, those uh, long nights in September, usually, till 5 in the morning. Um, and then, you know, I got a job and had gotten married, had some children, four. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
Yeah, that visual observing till five in the morning, well, I, uh, that didn't work out so well anymore, uh, especially living in the city. So, um, but a few years ago, three years ago, we moved out to uh, CARP uh, because I was working in Canada. And um, the commute was just a killer from downtown. So um, I got back into doing astronomy. And um, well, I, I had this crazy idea that I, I wanted to uh, take some spectra of some stars because um, I had done spectroscopy back when I was a grad student. And well, I didn't have a telescope that could track. So I well, you know, went out and I got myself a, a G11, which is a Lozmany mount with a Celestron telescope, a C11, to go on it, and uh, waited for a spectrometer to come in the mail. Um, I'll show you that later. Uh, in the meantime, I got a camera. I had a camera, and I put it on the telescope. I figured I'll just take a few pictures with it, see what happens. And um, yeah, you know, it turned out it was sort of fun. So I started doing some imaging. So I'd like to show you a few pictures from last year. This is before. Uh, that that dome there. I'll show you some more pictures of that. Um, let's see that way. Yeah. So um, before I had a dome, I had the telescope in the backyard under a tarp most of the time, and uh, take the tarp off and take some shots. Um, this particular one um, is interesting because it's it's uh, it, this is an interacting system. They're, these two galaxies are actually interacting with each other. Uh, no, you, it's hard to tell from this picture because they're really well separated. But uh, it turns out that um, if you look in neutral hydrogen with a, with a radio telescope, the, the radio maps, they, the, the galaxies are overlapping. And they actually took um, rotation curves. Let's see, which one's the laser? That one's the laser? Yeah. They took uh, rotation curves of this galaxy, and, and it turns out that the stars in the center aren't moving like they're supposed to, and presumably due to the interaction here from that, from that galaxy. So this was... Uh, this is a fairly medium length exposure, two hours of, uh, of light and um, about 40 minutes of color. So it, that's, that's not too bad uh, as, as things go in astrophotography. Um, this is NGC, well, 672. Um, it's 11th magnitude, so you could pick it up in a, a visually quite easily, I would say. It's in triangulum. And, uh, this was an ST8 camera, which is all, all these pictures I'm going to show you were with an ST8 camera, which is an SBIC camera. And um, I guess I'll go on to the next one. The, that, but that one, by the way, was done with a focal reducer on the telescope. So it's a little wider field of view than, than the others. Let's just go on to the next one. Now, this one is really cool. Um, this is a galaxy in Coma Berenices that uh, is, from if you take a short exposure, you won't say much about it. It looks, looks like a pretty normal spiral, but it's got this thing sticking out the front. Uh, you notice the, that jet, and then sort of an arc in front here. And, and as far as I can tell, I, I, I only found one other good picture of that. Uh, it doesn't really that, that arc doesn't show up in the POS sky place very well. This is a picture by David Mallon, who picked it up. That's the sort of led me onto this guy. And um, really, some weird stuff going on in there. I don't fully. I don't think anybody's really good, done a really good study of what exactly that is. There's a, a quasar right about here that people have done all kinds of studies about. And there's a, a, a dwarf galaxy there, and another one there, and a, and a counter tail, they call it, to this tail. But um, the dynamics are still unknown of what this guy is. This is uh, four and a half hours of, uh, of images, uh, com both at f10 and f6. So I had to combine two different image scales together to, to get this one. It just turned out that I was sort of experimenting with a different focal length, so uh, trying trying different things. Um, this uh, this particular um, picture won me a prize uh, for uh, one of these uh, the S SCT user group prize. And I got a little telescope for my trouble, a little uh, Astrotech uh, refractor. So that's now sitting on the C11, um, and I use it to uh, find stars with the spectroscope that I'll show you later, because when you have the spectroscope on the on the telescope, you can't see anything. Um, and for comparison, so those are multi-hour shots. For comparison, um, this picture while I was waiting for it to get dark. And so this was a, this is a globular cluster in Hercules. And it's obviously a lot brighter. This is M92. So it's, it's six and a half magnitude. And it's only 20 minutes per channel. So um, big difference trying to take pictures of those faint galaxies versus bunches of stars like that because it, the, the, 
the brightness fa factor is nearly, well, nearly 100,000. Um, lots of good colors in it, though. But uh, whenever I look at this picture, I think, well, you know, I need a better tube because you can, you can notice some of the stars down here. They're not exactly perfectly round. And that's because it's a schmidt cassegrain So now I have to convince my wife that I need a RC or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do that, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I think the C11 will have to do for a while. Um, Is that kid? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I get them to work. Sorry? Do you mind if I interrupt for one second? It just occurred to me. In the don't take too long, Glenn. The previous picture, if you go back to it again, just so people can remind themselves. Not oh. that one. The other previous. That, that one. one. That thing that looks kind of like a jet with a bit of an arc, you know what it suggests to me? Is that it's actually the disrupted remains of a, maybe a small uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxy. Oh, yeah, it could be. Tightly could be. stretched out yeah. as it's being torn apart. What's really odd is that it's so straight. And that, by the way, that that length uh, is big time. Like that, that's where did I write down there was seventy-five thousand light years or something like that across here. There's a laser. That's seventy-five thousand. This is the this is the distance across a normal sized galaxy, and it's straight. So it's um, we're probably deviling. Uh, almost edge onto the orbital plane of the. Yeah, the maybe. Galaxy. But then you've got this arc here that that might be probably a big a sphere. Looks deeper like deeper it ran into something. So yeah, deeper exposure would be very impressive to see. Yeah, I ran out of time, I guess. On uh, that's the problem with Ottawa, right? You <laughs> By the time you get enough exposure, it's uh, it's gone into the west, and uh, or the clouds have kicked in on you. Like this month, I got I think I got two nights in June, so suggest, tough does break. Does they put the Hubble Deep Field or the Hubble the Space Telescope on that object? Uh, I don't think they've done it. They haven't they haven't put the Hubble on that guy yet. I couldn't find any Hubble images of that area, so uh, could be cool. Yeah. Well, maybe somebody will get a 20-inch telescope in New Mexico and point at it and see what happens. What's the odds of that? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of other targets, I guess. So, so I was gonna. My this is my last picture before I get into the spectroscopy stuff. This um, this guy here, I spent a, a lot of time. This is five hours of luminance and four hours of color, and um, it's it's 13th magnitude, so it's it's not too bright. And it's it's good distance, 200 million light years to this guy. And it turns out that this this object is one of the bigger bigger galaxies known. Um, this galaxy is because it's so far, it, it's still pretty small. Um, it's only three arc second, three arc one, uh, three arc minutes by one arc minute, but its um, its size is is 50 kiloparsecs. So that works out to 150 odd million light years. So good size. Can, I think our our galaxy is clocked in around 100,000. Was, so the largest one, I looked it up uh, the other day, the largest, the two largest known are, one is in Pavo, so I don't have a, any chance of seeing that at this point in time, and it's 350,000 uh, light years across, and the biggest known turns out is this sort of unknown galaxy in Coma Berenice, it's called Malin 1, so if anyone wants to take a crack at it, it's, it's 18th magnitude, so a bit tough, but um, it's uh, 200 kiloparsecs in diameter, so that's, that's 600,000 light years. So humongous, there's some monsters out there. But this one here is also unique because it's, it seems the astro astrophysicists figure it's got two spiral arms, two sets of spiral arms, this outer one and these inner ones. It's um, not quite sure what's going on, but it's, it may have had collisions. There's a, there's a thing here, and, and this is sort of anomalous, this shape here. So um, it's fun when you, you, when you take deep exposures, you sometimes come across stuff that's just not um, evident uh, in the shorter ones, Eric, obviously. Four hours of color. Is it four hours total or four hours um, the color was, uh, on average, nine. I had 10, 9, and 5 exposures of 10 minutes a piece. So, yeah, 4 hours total. Yeah. And so the luminance, it's usually, you usually end up with, your total color usually ends up about equal to your, your total luminance if, if you get it right. Um, you can try to get away with less, lumin less color, but I find it on these faint ones that you, you end up just bringing out noise. Um, so that's the imaging part, and that's what I did last year. I got a whole bunch of stuff on a hard drive I just haven't got to yet. It's um, too much spectroscopy getting in the way, I guess, mostly. So I'm going to go on to um, what I used to. Uh, this is, by the way, the, those pictures were taken with the telescope in the backyard under tarp in between rain showers. Um, and then in October, I got tired of taking the tarp off and having wet grass and sitting in the wet grass and computer uh, two computers went kablooey, power supplies being outside. So I got this thing. And holy smokes, what a lightsaber. So um, it's all plastic. It's the same stuff they make lawn furniture out of. And it, it's pretty durable. 
Um, I plunked it down the f night I got it. I think it came in the truck at 6 o'clock, and by 4 in the morning I had it set up. Couldn't wait. <laughs> it, it actually even rained that night, but that didn't matter to us. Like, whatever, it's raining. <laughs> so uh, I had it up, and um, then it was uh, to use it. And, and it was fine at first, except I, I, I didn't have a floor. So I got a floor in there, and uh, that's um, after I took it down. but to do something else, which I'll show you. But I put a floor in, and that's, that was really good. The floor keeps you and your stuff dry because the grass is amazingly wet, actually. <laughs> the dew that comes off that stuff, and just the moisture. So uh, floor is uh, really recommended uh, if you've got a... No, a lot of people make a whole deck and stuff, but I just sort of, oh, well, you know, I plunked it down. Jeez, it's pretty solid on the ground there. So that was uh, so that's the, the mount, the G11 mount. Um, notice I've got holes cut in the floor because you can't be standing on the floor with the mount. It's you pretty much twitch, and your telescope will twitch, and there goes your nice pinpoint stars. So I got little rocks in the, in the ground. And it's, so the three, three tripod legs are sitting on rocks, holes cut out. Um, that's me digging in my backyard. Uh, more rocks and dirt. Um, but you know I'm on, the, I'm on the essentially Canadian shield, which uh, turned out to be OK, because uh, two feet down, I hit bedrock. So I, did, I could stop digging and say, I can't dig anymore, just unless I have a dynamite, uh, which they did have down the road. But yeah, <laughs> they were blasting for the new houses around the corner for us. So we had, we had a blast. Every morning, the house would go, whoa. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. So after digging, um, put the concrete in there. Fortunately, my father-in-law was here this spring, and I sort of, he knew about concrete, and I knew zilch. And um, he was, they were coming back from Florida, so I, um, essentially what constricted him into service and then uh, I got concrete poured so uh, this a, it's a dual tapered pier uh, so that the mount has more clearance so I'll show you that it's more clear in the next picture you got to make sure it's it's level because once that concrete sets that's it you're, uh, <laughs> you're not moving it and so that's Sebastian in the corner he's he's my youngest he was uh, trying to help yeah and um, that's what it looked like in the dome when you're done um, Concrete is uh, that's 10 inch and then a six inch. I did uh, an Excel spreadsheet with the you know engineering formulas and yeah yeah it doesn't move it's like an arc second not even if you lean on it with all your weight so um, that tapered pier is really good with with this mount because the, that telescope when it swings down it it comes real close to the pier and this way without that top part the the, th the skinny top part the telescope can go an extra hour nearly of tracking for it smacked into something. Um, on the back there is, is the new image train. I didn't have an A08 back for those pictures I showed you. And then I got an A08 because I got just tired of trying to do the tracking at, at 2,800 millimeters of focal length, at 2,900. Um, and so I had to get that Lozman EMA cylinder. It's a piece of metal with a holes in the bottom that fits that. That cylinder costs more than all the materials for the pier. <laughs> oh, well, you know, what do you do? You know, one piece of aluminum, but uh, the bolts were a buck a piece. Uh, got them at uh, Home Depot and uh, six bags of concrete or eight bags of concrete, some plywood, scrap wood, and um, a lot of labor and some water. There you go, solid pier. Um, the plywood ring turns out to be really great to put your eyepieces and flashlight on. Actually, it turns out. So, um, next slide. Uh, I've got what it looks like now. I did a few mods to this dome. Um, those big wooden things are, uh, well, I call it a portable zenith truss. The original name coined for it was a PZT, a portable, no, a portable zenith table. Yes, that's what he called it. Um, well, this dome, when it opens up, you can't see to the north. With your telescope in the middle of the dome, pointed straight up, you look right into that lip, which has got about eight inches of overhang. And that telescope has got a radius of five and a half inches, so you need 13 and a half inches of offset to clear the dome lip to look straight up. And that gets you only to 45 degrees declination. If you want to go norther, more north than that, you're stuck. You'd have to sort of look under the dome or beside the dome. It just doesn't work when you want to track for four hours straight. So I got these pieces of wood, all pressure treated, Home Depot, uh, cost me $40 of wood, whatever bunch of screws and uh, put that together and I can slide the dome off out of the way it's great just slides off there and I had to put I didn't have stops at first so it was pretty scary at five in the morning you really <laughs> don't you know you're like just 
and you can't see really well, and you know you can't hold the flash. You're holding the flash in your mouth, sort of, and trying to push the dome off, and you're wondering, geez, it's going to fall off and tumble on the tiles. Yeah, so I got the stops on there and the side rail, and so when I hit the stops, I know, okay, good. Um, one thing is, of course, it it uh, you sort of have to choose. Do you want it to be rotating or pushed off? So I I um, have to make up my mind at the start if I want to have protection from wind and, and do. Uh, but otherwise, it works really well. Um, those those pod bays are great. You just all kinds of junk in there. Just throw it in and forget about it. Uh, and the computer has a place for itself in the corner. And um, the door is to the left. And you have to do a double duck to get out. Unfortunately, you open the door, you go through the door, you close the door, then you duck again to go under the dome lip, the uh, the roof lip. But you know, I'm still young, I guess. So no big deal for a while. Otherwise, I, I guess you'd have to dig a trench or something to walk in. But, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, never mind the grass. I'm not very good at keeping my grass. So, <laughs> um, what's the next slide? I mean, yeah, it's really well. You know, geez, we had a lot. Cut the grass a lot this June. Man, life. This is a spectrograph. This was the original intention when I got into that German Equatorial Mount and SCT instead of my Dobsonian telescope. This is what I was wanted to go and do. This spectroscope is, uh, was bought as a kit and I put it together, but it, all the pieces were pre-cut. It was just pretty much putting screws together and, and, um, and getting things aligned. Uh, but you can buy them now off the shelf, or you can still sort of buy as a kit, as you pay a little less. Um, it's a great instrument. It's, it's got two features that I found out when I was trying to make one myself that are super important to the ease of use and your sanity. Number one is a reflective slit. It reflects the light. So the star comes in through the telescope and is the, the focal plane is put onto that slit. Some light goes through the slit and onto the grating to be analyzed. Some reflects off the slit because the slit is narrower than the star and ends up going off a mirror through a couple lenses, relay lenses, onto another camera, which is, they could be a webcam, could be any kind of camera. In my case, it's, um, it's an, a remote guide head for an SBIG camera. And that lets you guide, keep that star on the slit. And you can actually see what you're doing that way, too, because you, essentially that guide camera is, is your main view into the sky. The camera looking behind the slit can't see anything. Uh, it sees spectra. It doesn't see a star field. But that guide camera sees a star field, so you can take a picture and, oh, there's that star. Okay, nudge, nudge, nudge on the slit. Terrific. Lock it there and start auto-guiding. Um, the light gets gets through the slit and then is relayed through a lens, the doublet, at the bottom left. So the, the cone of light coming out of the slit is the same F number as, as what the telescope produces. And so um, the design of the spectroscope has to be optimized to a certain F number. You have to choose a certain size grading, a certain size lens, because you don't want to make them too small or you'll lose light. If you make them too big, well, then you just made it heavier for nothing. Um, so this, this spectroscope is optimized between F8 and, and F11 or so. Uh, so F10 being the, the prime target because of all those SCTs out there. And so the light goes through that lens and is recollimated into a, a parallel beam that would make a, spot, a, a circle at infinity, hits the grating, and reflects back. Now it's called a literal because the literal, uh, an English guy long ago, figured out that this is a really useful way of making uh, that lens do work twice. And so the light goes, hits off the grating, is dispersed, so this, the different colors of light go at different angles mm -hmm. through that lens back on your camera and then you can take a spectrum. Um, lots of details to worry about. You've got to have the distance between that lens and the slit just right. You have to have your distance from your camera to that lens just right. Uh, you've got to tune the angle of the grating just right, etc. But if you, get, if you do it all right, you get a, a sharp spectra at the other end and you get some results. What do I have next? Oh, yeah, this is what the, can the, the, the doohickey looks like on the telescope. Um, it's about the same size as, as a C11 uh, in diameter. Uh, there's two cameras there. One's an ST7, and the other one's a, an SBIG remote guide head, which plugs into the ST7 to be a guider. Uh, and then there's a whole whack of wires that you don't see behind, but it's amazing how many wires grow on these telescopes as soon as you put a camera. It's, uh, there must be eight of them. Um, actually, a big problem, big headache for dragging the mount when you're trying to track. If the cables aren't routed just right, pull the mount and stars will trail and headaches. Um, close up. That cable that goes into the side is the other super 
feature that they built into this thing, an internal neon lamp. Uh, internal lamp allows you to get a calibration frame anytime you want. You flip that switch, turn a knob, and you've got neon light illuminating the slit, and now you can take a spectrum of neon, which is very well known, all where all the lines are, um, and that is your calibration reference for your wavelength. Very important, because otherwise you're searching for telluric lines, which are absorption by water in the atmosphere, or hoping that your H alpha line is where it's supposed to be, etc. Um, the knob on the bottom right is the uh, adjuster for the um, grating. Uh, generally don't touch it very much because your camera sees a whole whack of spectrum at once. It sees a whole bunch of wavelengths in one go. So you'll turn that knob to move the whole s spectra over. So you may want to look in the blue or the red, but you, you generally leave it, leave it be. And the side panel, um, this thing here opens up so you can get at the lens and adjust the focus of the lens to get it right onto the camera there. Uh, that's the knob for the, the neon. Some, some uh, adventurous people have already motorized it so that they can, uh, well, that's easy. That's just a switch. But they motorized this knob so that they can be inside their house while taking calibration frames. I'm not there yet, but maybe a couple of years. But th that would be cool. Because I, I can do everything else imaging-wise from inside the house through Cat5 cable. The computers, there's two computers. One talks to the other. And once you've got everything set up, um, you don't need to be there especially with a non-slit dome. If you had a slit dome, then you need a fancy motor and some software to keep that slit centered on the telescope, but not in this case, low tech. Okay, right. Yeah? Can you get the, the neon source and, and or, well, the neon uh, spectrum and the source spectrum on the same image? Sometimes? You could, but if you did that, you'd probably sort of, you'd wipe out your, your target spectra because this neon is really well, bright. No, it's, uh, the neon spectral lines go right, they limit the whole slit, so the whole sensor's pretty much got a set of lines. So this, this particular, this is a neon spectrum right here, cropped. These lines go, so imagine the sensor is like that big, the whole screen, and I've just cropped off a little strip of it, and these lines go all the way up and down. Um, so the slit is up and down, and the spectrum, and the, the grading is such a line so that the light is spread out left to right, um, orthogonal to the slit, and so that's what a neon spectrum looks like. There's very few lines in the blue down here, and the green and blue. Very annoying problem with neon, but the next lamp up is a thorium argon lamp, and it costs several, several hundred dollars with a fancy power supply. So, you know, one of these days, but I'll make do with a neon, which is a couple bucks for a bulb. What's the advantage of the argon? Thorium argon lamps have spectral lines all the way across from, from the deep violet right up into the infrared. It's, um, it's the, the standard what uh, professionals use. So, um, but this one's got tons of lines in the region of interest, which is the H alpha right here. So that's why it was chosen. Um, this is a spectrum of a comet. Remember we had that comet that disappeared last fall and was like, geez, I got the spectroscope and the telescope here. I, there's a comet. Okay, go, let's go for it. And uh, so I took a spectrum of the comet. Um, that particular swath here is that, if you can imagine, taking this, um, this is a cross-section of the comet. So that's, that's wavelength, that's actual spatial direction. So the comet was very big, that's the nucleus, and that's sort of the coma, this, this faint thing out here. So um, you can take your pick of where you want to take a spectra. You can take a line through the middle, take a line out through the side, and you'll get different spectra because the comet is a pretty big reflector of sunlight. So in the middle, it's mostly a solar spectrum with a few cometary attributes to it. But if you take a spectrum like this one here is a line out on the, on the edge here. I think this one is arc, one arc minute from the core. Um, you get a different spectrum from the middle. And I've subtracted the solar background. This is flat. Um, if you look at this, it's actually this line would be a great big hump like that that's brighter here than over there, right? Uh, that's just the solar reflection. So I, I processed that out, I flatted it out, and this is what you get left over, and you get a whole bunch of peaks and valleys. And the uh, peaks tell you what is emitting, and the valleys are absorption by some gas or dust. Um, some of them are from your atmosphere, H2O, that's our atmosphere, H, um, H alpha, that's probably solar uh, from, the, from the sun itself, actually. O2, O2, those are our atmosphere again. Um, but there's a bunch of other ones that are definitely common. The C2 band, this whole thing here, 550, that's 5,500 angstroms is 550 nanometers, which is right in the green, a little, almost 
lime green. Um, 5,300 is, 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 is a good green. Uh, 500 is, is towards sort of a blue green. And 480, 480 or so is a cyan color, and 450 is a blue. So that's C2, which is molecular carbon, more molecular carbon. I don't know what that 5130 is. I haven't figured out that. So those are from the comet. They're, it's emitting colors or light in the blue and the green. Why you get the blue-green color? And, but it's mostly carbon. And there's another big band here, carbon. Um, cyanogen is here. And there's actually more of it down here, which I couldn't get. Uh, below 4,000. So cyanogen emits more in the purple or UV. Um, these, these O1 lines here, those are forbidden transitions that don't occur on Earth, but they can occur in space because of the density. Um, Hertzberg wrote a whole thesis about that. Um, so there's a bunch of them. These two lines here are actually the same lines that produce aurora, those two there in the red. So um, cool stuff. You can go and analyze what's in a comet this way. And then uh, recently, I took another spec. Oh, by the way, the details. So that was 9 times 600. So that's 9 frames of 10 minutes a piece. So it's 90 minutes of acquisition. Where I, and then I stacked the frames. And so I got fairly good signal and noise, because it was a very bright comet. So next thing that just occurred recently, there were two nova in uh, Ophiuchus one after the other within a few days. Uh, one was too low, one was at minus 27 degrees declination, couldn't get it. But this one here was at minus 23, and um, I got three nights where it didn't rain <laughs> and there were no clouds, amazing. Um, I would have taken a lot more, but just, you know, just things didn't work out. This guy is faint. This is 10th magnitude as opposed to Comet Holmes, which was, by the way, nearly third, I think. Um, so. I had to uh, expose for, well, they were not long exposures, but there's a lot more noise in these. This great big peak here, that's H alpha. I've got another slide separate for that. But all these little peaks here are indications of elements. And those, are, those turn out to be iron emit, uh, blown off by the nova. Those, those peaks there and those peaks there is different transitions for iron, all kinds of them. Um, the first night, the blue trace, I couldn't find the, the sodium doublet. But eventually, this brown trace, it did show up. The brown trace is the last night, and these peaks were really now much more easy to see. And that's because I have 40 minutes of, a, of acquisition on the last trace, and the first night I only got 10 minutes, um, just because of me screwing up and light coming, you know, dawn coming up on me and stuff like that. Uh, and O2, this emission, this is this is again our atmosphere biting into the uh, the light that the nova has produced. This 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 con this is called the continuum. This is broad envelope. The Nova bits lines and, and a broad envelope, just like our sun does. And uh, the O2 bites in there. And these great big lines here are light pollution. Or aurora lines, I'm not sure. Could be either. Um, and this whole band here, you notice how there's a stripe. That's the spectra from the star, that stripe. So the star is spread out in a long line. These lines here are through everywhere in the sky. So they, they make lines that are the full size of your slit. And that's, li that's most likely light pollution in here because that's around sodium, so in the visible. Uh, but fortunately, you can subtract them out because you can take a, a profile here, and then you take a profile right on that strip, and then you subtract them, and that stuff goes away. So those three peaks do not show up here because you can subtract them out. Fancy stuff. And so that makes spectroscopy a great thing to do in the city where you've got loads of light pollution. Well, a spectrometer, no problem. You can, you can separate it out and process it out and it doesn't bother you. All that, all that light pollution that normally would make a great big haze in your picture gets spread out over lots of wavelengths and um, doesn't really bother you at all, especially if you have a slit. And the last line I've got uh, is the H alpha line. So I've zoomed in on that H alpha line which was right off the scale. So that's the main emitter of, that, of a nova is the H alpha line. And amazingly, it changes quite rapidly over those two weeks. So the uh, blue line is what I measured the first night out, uh, not very much compared to the continuum, uh, and a width that turns out to give you an expansion velocity of 750 kilometers per second. So that means that nova, the material in the nova was expanding radially at 750 kilometers per second in all directions. Now that's a mean velocity because it's a, it's a broad curve, so there's a whole continuum of velocities there, but the average is around 750, as the scientists like to, to put it. Uh, and then uh, I got the pink curve, and it was a lot brighter in H alpha. 
And then two nights later, it changed dramatically to a three-peaked Java here, that brown thing. For, as far as I can tell, the, um, the Nova must have sort of broken up into different pieces where you'd have an inner shell perhaps still expanding very, very rapidly and an outer shell expanding much slower. And so the rapid shell are these two peaks out here, one in each direction. If it's going towards you, it's blue shifted. If it's coming away, going away from you, it's red shifted. And um, those two peaks are the rapid shell. And the narrow thing in the middle is, I guess, the, maybe the outer shell that's slowing down or something like that. Um, some interesting dynamics. And that's about it, I guess. I hope I didn't go over time. Right? Yeah, that's the last one. That's it. I've got the story. As a bonus, I happen to bring something. So you get an idea of what it actually looks like in someone's hands. Door price. This is this is it. Yeah. Door price. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One more ticket, right? I'll trade you for a twenty inch. Um, that's the thing. All the little shiny screws and stuff. But it's uh, it's all sheet metal, and. Um, the, that makes it very light, so because it's already heavy enough to go on the back of tells it with a big camera like that. But it goes that on right? there. That's the micrometer for the uh, grating switch for the neon and the flap turns the bulb and puts the bulb in front of the slit. And um, yeah, that's it. There's a slit inside. I can't. I don't want to really open it because mm -hmm. try to keep it sealed as much as I can. Keep the earwigs out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've invaded my dorm. <laughs> Excellent. Anyways. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. That was excellent observing report, and here's a little token. Oh, I get a star. That's right, you get a star. Oh, right. Well done, Eric. Okay. Rolf. If anybody has any questions for Eric, uh, I think. We're, oh, did you have a question for Eric right now? What are the uh, intensity units? Um, the intensity, I'm sorry? Well, you've got AD, U. Oh, yeah, right. That's. Um, I scaled them because they weren't the same number, the same exposure lengths on each night. I scaled it to uh, units uh, per minute of flux. So you can tell this is not very much, but these ADU are a number of counts the camera produces. Uh, it's complicated because you've got gain, electrons to photons, and you've got efficiency through the mirrors and all that. But you're roughly you're talking a photon per minute that scale. So I'm, I'm down here. You're getting a few photons per minute. Uh, barely none, and there at the peak you're getting 700 photons. But per second, you can imagine, down at 10, you're getting less than a photon per second. Um, so you really got to be careful with your your processing to get rid of it. So some of these were smoothed out. I smoothed out some of the traces with a filter. But uh, yeah. Okay, maybe one. Yep. Go ahead. I was just wondering why there's only iron there. Well, those are the only ones I was able to identify. I'm sure there's tons more of stuff, but I'm still a rookie at figuring out what's what. It's actually, uh, I don't have any good books about it. So sort of just doing a bit of searching and, and finding other spectra of other nova where they've identified lines. Um, I guess you'd have to be a true spectroscopist to go figure that out. Um, but I'm sure there's, there's, there's apparently there's calcium and, and uh, sodium and uh, magnesium in that, in that nova that I read about. So yeah, I'm sure a pro could yeah. identify a ton of lines. Perfect, okay. Thank you, Eric. I think we're just going to move on here just so that we're, yep. the hour's running on. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Rolf. Okay, this is uh, really just by way of introduction. Uh, this is a picture of Jupiter I took this morning. Um, and um, uh, I was talking to some people at the last meeting, and uh, we sort of came to the realization that it might be fun to have sort of a lunar and planetary imaging workshop where, where we'd... Um, uh, you know, share some ideas of how we would uh, capture images and process them and stuff like that. So next slide. Um, so, so we're going to um, uh, try and have this next week um, at, uh, at our place. Um, so um, uh, next slide. Well, I guess that, that's it. There's a map of approximately where we are. And uh, I guess... Uh, I don't know, Eric Karp must be on there somewhere too. Yeah, so not, not too far from, uh, from Eric. Um, so that's that. Oh, by the way, I'm going to show a bunch of stuff here. And uh, don't worry about having to remember this. I have handouts if you, if you want this. Or just send me an email and um, uh, I, I can email all this to you. 
but uh, you don't know my email, so just come, <laughs> come and see me after the meeting for my email. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, okay, so, so let, let's get ready for this. So we've got about a week. Uh, okay, and some people are, I guess that I've talked to already know about this, but you still have time, uh, about a week. So uh, one thing you can do is download a bunch of free software. And, uh, and the main uh, program is called Registax, uh, and there's the, the URL for it. And again, don't, don't worry about writing this down. I'll give you a handout later if you're interested. Um, and what that does is that, that, that will take all your uh, images, and typically what you'll want to do is you'll uh, capture about uh, a minute or two minutes worth of, uh, of frames, and you may end up with uh, a thousand frames or more. And these all have to be sorted and uh, aligned and stacked and uh, processed. And Registax is really the main program to do that. Uh, so you really need that. You can't, can't function without it. And these are, these uh, bits of software are nearly all free. If you want to do a more additional uh, processing after or another nice general purpose uh, image processing tool, it's called Iris, and that's free. Um, another very important thing is uh, noise reduction because no matter what you do, you're going to end up with a lot of noise on your uh, image and you want to get rid of that noise. So there's something here called selective glossy selective Gaussian blur noise reduction and uh, that uh, sort of removes the noise and preserves the the detail. Uh, next slide. Uh, and another very interesting piece of software that you should probably have anyway. It's called Virtual Dub uh, for editing uh, videos and you can use it to uh, eliminate bad frames or to adjust contrast. Well, that's not highly recommended to do, but uh, you can use it for all kinds of uh, editing on, on your raw uh, image sequences before you do any uh, other processing. If you're really sophisticated, you probably don't need to know about this yet because you know it already and you need a program to combine your, uh, your three colors, uh, your red, green and blue and uh, one of the programs, the one that I use is PaintShop Pro because it wasn't very expensive. Uh, you can use uh, Photoshop, which is very expensive and maybe marginally better. Uh, but they both have free, free trial downloads, so if, if you want to use it for about a month before you buy it, you can, you can download them. Um, okay, next, another very useful uh, uh, piece of software. Uh, it's called uh, MetaGuide, and what that does is um, you point your webcam, use your webcam and point the telescope at a star. And uh, what that will do is uh, it will analyze your uh, diffraction image and uh, allow you to see how, how your telescope is aligned. So it's, it's very useful. It's, all, it's, ba ba it's virtually real time. Uh, and you can just tweak the uh, collimation knobs and, and get your uh, collimation done perfectly. And it even works if the seeing is relatively poor. So that's a, a highly recommended uh, piece of software. Uh, I used it, it took me maybe five minutes to collimate without ever having used it before. Uh, okay, next, uh, uh, for hardware, if you're just starting out, uh, the best thing is the 2U cam, which is now the model number is SPC900NC, and I just bought one, uh, which is my third 2 cam, and uh, it was only $40. Um, and there's lots of dealers on eBay that sell them. But make sure you get that exact model number because there's other ones that you know cost only twenty dollars, but they're nowhere near as good. So that's really the one you want. So uh, the other very interesting thing about uh, the two U cam is the um, it comes with a, a capture program. Okay, so what you need is you need to capture your video. Most webcams. Uh, especially the cheap ones will just, you know, you can see the video or maybe you can capture a still image, but you can't actually capture the video. Well, this one comes with the uh, video capture program. It's called um, V-Record. Virtual Dub also does uh, capturing, by the way. So, it, and surprisingly, I found that V-Records with uh, e any webcam that I've tried, uh, even, even the Luminera uh, webcam, um, it has limited functionality on, on some of the webcams, but you, it, it, you know, it's a very cheap program that will, well, it's free, it comes with the camera, uh, that you can use to uh, capture video. 
Uh, okay, so and the next very important thing is there's a local company called Luminera, and they make probably the, the very best webcams for, um, for imaging, and they're specifically designed for lunar and planetary imaging. They're a local company, and um, uh, the, the, uh, the local rep, well, the, the one rep for uh, this particular line of cameras has offered iTree to lend some for this, uh, for this workshop. So if you want to try these out before buying them, uh, there should be several available uh, to try. They come in different uh, uh, configurations, different uh, uh, sensor sizes and uh, color uh, monochrome. Uh, it would be useful if you installed the drivers beforehand um, so that uh, you know, you'd be all set for the workshop. And uh, finally, there's a program called uh, Lucam Recorder, which is designed specifically for the Luminera camera, and they have a trial version as well. So all the software that I presented, you, you don't have to pay for any of it, because uh, uh, even the ones that are, uh, you know, you buy, they have, there's a trial period. So, so you'll be all set for the, uh, for the workshop. Um, so next slide. So this is sort of the agenda I had in mind. Uh, maybe, you know, you come around 5 o'clock, or come around 8 o'clock, wherever, whenever you want. Um, uh, you know, if you want, we can have a barbecue beforehand, and, and we have a pool, and the sh weather should be nice for swimming, that sort of thing. So if you come early, you know, uh, come for a barbecue and uh, look around, and you'll have time to set up your, your equipment and everything. Uh, and then we'd start. So uh, over the next week, uh, uh, the Moon and Jupiter will be uh, the, the best targets that we can have. Uh, and um, so uh, the Moon, we can start imaging fairly early on at night, you know, just when it basically you can start to see it. And then uh, after that, we can start uh, looking at uh, the processing and we'd, we'd come inside and we'd, we'd uh, 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 you know, share our, our uh, AVIs and um, Put them on one computer, and we'd, we'd look at look at them on a screen, and uh, hoping I can get them onto the 52-inch screen so that you know we're not huddling around a little LCD monitor or something like that. Um, and then uh, by midnight, Jupiter should be well placed, and uh, uh, be a good time to start imaging uh, Jupiter. And one o'clock, I don't know how, how late it could go for that, um, but very important there's a good chance it'll be cloudy, right? So, uh, so what you do if you're interested in this, you know, bring your ABIs if you're taking them in the last year, two years, whatever, even over the next week, and uh, then we'll just do the, the processing part. Uh, even the barbecue is probably okay if it's cloudy, if it's, if it's raining, I don't know what we'll do, but anyway, so we can do that. So, and if you have some AVIs, you know, just put them on a, a DVD or a memory stick or um, a USB hard drive, something like that, and uh, just just bring them along, and we can we can do that too. Okay, so if you're interested, just see me after and get all that obscure information, all these URLs and uh, um, my email if you want it. So, any uh, brief questions? Yes, John. Bring your own barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can. Well, we'll have we have a barbecue, but you know, bring your. Right, bring your own stuff. Yeah. Bring your own meat. Bring your own meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. So Excellent. hope to see some of you there. Thank you, Rob. Okay. On to our observing uh, section now, Bob. Um. This is uh, NGC 896, in case you can't read, but uh, it's uh, found uh, just below Cassiopeia right now. It's nice and high in the sky in the Milky Way. And um, this is about a four hour exposure. Uh, one of the things I liked about it was there's some very yellow stars in the corner. Um, and uh, I'm not the only person who's recorded these, so these are not a, a, a sort of a processing artifact, I don't believe. Uh, last week, uh, last month, I'm sorry, somebody asked me uh, how I got the color, and I was actually embarrassed to admit that I had to kind of process the color in a bit. So I went out and took some uh, calibration images of a star with the same color as the sun, 
And there was absolutely no color uh, image, uh, processing done on this one at all. This is the way it came out of the camera because it's now calibrated. Okay, next one. Uh, this is the challenge object that uh, Attila came up with. Um, this is about a four hour, I'm sorry, this is a two hour shot because it's going down. <laughs> and so it's, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get very much of it before it disappeared into the trees. And uh, it's uh, faint and small, and I'm taking it with a fairly short focal length camera. So as Chris pointed out, it's fuzzy. Okay. Um, this is the, uh, this cluster was pointed out to me by a friend of mine called Paul Shepard a long, long time ago. And he called it the ET cluster. I think it's also called the OWL cluster. And again, it's just in Cassiopeia, or nearly in Cassiopeia. Um, and uh, it's really fascinating object in, uh, in, a, in a telescope. Uh, and and uh, I, I think you'd really like to see it. And it really does look like ET. Is it, well, you, how do you see ET in there? Uh, I just see the eyes and the body. And does, the does anybody else see ET in this image? Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you see ET in that image? <laughs> 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 we played. Chris and I played a bit with his image. Do, do you know what's really sad is? I actually looked. <laughs> I actually looked on the web for an image of of uh, ET that would show up like that. I couldn't find one. <laughs> Just back up one. Yeah. Okay, now watch it. Now watch it. You, you didn't watch it appear yet. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, here we go. That's awesome. You guys worked just right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Okay, three, three. <laughs> Gary. Oops, sorry. Okay, just three images uh, this month. Uh, as you know, I had the Mellencam Pro, which Rock has uh, upgraded me now to the Mellencam Hyper Plus. So now instead of a two second integration, so it's at three and a half seconds, I can go all, all the way to 56 seconds, which is overkill. It'd be like snow. But uh, this is pretty well I see live on the screen. This is the, uh, the Trifid Nebula. It's uh, just a stacked image of about 20 frames, uh, 23 and a half second frames um, processed with, uh, with uh, Photoshop elements. Of course, nice little bit of detail here. Not too bad, but still it's a rough image. It's nothing like, like we've seen tonight. Just excellent shots here tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, the Ring Nebula again. Uh, Paul, I know, Paul, you're, you're always wondering in, you know, on size. Um, yes, the, the Mellencam does have a small size, but one th great thing about the Mellencam is it actually has a zoom feature. So I actually was able to blow up this image on the, on the, uh, like on the computer screen. But again, about another 30 frames at three and a half seconds. Processed a bit, but uh, a lot of great detail in, uh, in the Ring Nebula M57. And now using the To You Cam on uh, our favorite planet, uh, Jupiter. Uh, again, I can't wait for the, uh, for the, uh, for the workshop for uh, Jupiter and the Moon, too. Um, I'm still missing something over here, but I did get some inspiration from Ralph tonight just on how to set the, uh, the scales on, on gamma, whatever. So I'm, I'm still getting this ghostly image over here in the processing. Uh, but these three shots were taken on June 20th, Friday, uh, two, weeks ago, two weeks from, from tonight. It was, uh, it was pretty clear, very transparent skies, and I uh, rolled, uh, rolled the roof at 3 a.m from being up at five in the morning, so that's a pretty long night. But, and the moon itself was only about one night after full. So as you can see, the melon cam is, is quite sensitive. So uh, can't wait for that workshop. And uh, thanks, folks. We'll see you next month. All right, excellent. Oh, oh, thank you. And one thing, too, with being clear tomorrow night, I will be uh, broadcasting starting at 10.30. 10.30, wondersofastronomy.com, and there's a, link, uh, there's a link for a live Yahoo. Hope to see you then. Uh, sign in, chat. If not, just uh, enjoy the photos. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Gary. And Paul, Glenn, or Paul? Well, this is the uh, challenge object of Attila Denko. Uh, I annotated this one, as you notice. It's, uh, it's no, it's, uh, it has the nickname of the box. That's the other name for this particular uh, uh, in Hickson 61. It's uh, just a little beyond, you have to have a fairly good scope to see it visually. Uh, this was only a 60 second exposure. So uh, I thought I'd, uh, is Atala here? Yep, yep. he's the son's son here. Oh, that's a good choice, Atala. 
Jeffrey. Yeah. Uh, oh, and that's uh, for this uh, same thing as Gary had. This for this time of the year, I think this is a nice thing to observe. It's uh, almost over hit the, in the evenings, and uh, very nice to observe the M57 uh, NGC 6720, uh, the uh, ring nebula. That's in Lyra. It's about about ninth magnitude. Right. Well, that's it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I've got two pictures here. Um, I'm not into the advanced stuff like some of you guys out there. This is just with us, um, um, an SLR camera on, uh, this one is uh, on piggyback. Um, I know Brian pointed something out. They were toying around with the image. They just told me prior to the meeting. Uh, you've got the, uh, where's the pointer? Mm, yeah, okay, there's um, the um, Deneb, I believe, right there. Just and down. Yeah, and you've got the um, um, NGC 7000, the uh, North American Nebula. This was a um, seven-minute exposure uh, using a 50-millimeter lens. Uh, it was extremely uh, windy. I don't know if there was any problem with the uh, guiding or anything, but this was on piggyback, so it's not as, as crucial. Um, it was a C8 using an HEQ-5 mount, and uh, the transparency was horrendous that night. It was uh, rather uh, dewy. Uh, with an f-stop of uh, 2.8 to compensate for the uh, blurring at the edge of the field so i don't think there's too much blurring and i think there's uh, the um, gamma gamma signi right, there, yeah. right right there thank you uh, nebula it's just starting to come in and i believe they they're pointing out something as well which will lead yeah. into my second image this um this is what you may see with the naked eye uh there's no magnification here of course near gamma signi but if you, I guess you can bring it up a little closer, you see two little stars right there. And um, could it come a little bit closer? Yeah, you don't, you don't see much, you, a nice gamma signi star there. And uh, you could see all the flaws in the uh, photograph as you come closer and closer. But which brings us to the second image, which is right here, NGC 6910. It's a uh, very distinctly Y-shaped uh, open cluster, and maybe it's these two stars that you see that uh, are blotched out in the first. But there are more more stars. There's about 40 uh, a total. Uh, it was discovered by F. W. Herschel in 1786, and the uh, pink nebulosity. There is some there, but you'll only see it in longer exposure astrophotographs. Uh, that one is about 4,000 light years away. Um, in interesting to note, astronomers are studying this cluster because of uh, stars called PMS stars. They are stars, the pre-main pre sequence stars, that are um, stars that are early in their age, going into the uh, uh, main sequence strip. If you know the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, the stars are um, sort of transitioning, and they're studying the uh, characteristics of those stars. I don't know too much ab about it as well. Uh, mostly, the region is H2, which is ionized, but there again, the pink nebulosity is is not shown, and that too was uh, uh, discovered by Friedrich Wilhelm uh, Friedrich. Wilhelm Herschel uh, around the 1700s. So that's it. All right, on to Attila's deep sky challenge. I like to take my telescope to public star parties and I show everyone from kids to grannies all stuff in the sky and often I get the question, how far can you see in that telescope? So this observing challenge is the answer to that question and the answer is not NGC 3079, which is a nice galaxy in the Ursa Major that would probably be a challenge object if you have, say, a 46-inch telescope. If you have, say, an um, 8 to 12-inch telescope, the companion galaxies you can see to the right, which are probably two or three times away, are, would probably be a challenge object. But even those are probably only a couple hundred million light years away, backyard stuff. The real challenge object, next slide please, is that little thing, which is a quasar. It's easily found by uh, locating this little asterism. Which is made of, uh, I think, 14 or 15th magnitude stars. <clears throat> What's interesting about this quasar is it's, it is the answer to the question. It's the furthest object that I've seen. It's 7.9 billion light years away and has an interesting story. Next slide. It was the, this is a blow-up of the uh, quasar. It's the first quasar which was discovered to be gravitationally lensed uh, in the middle 1970s, I believe. 
It looks like there are two quasars there. Those are the blue blotches. Physically in space, there's only one quasar there at an enormous distance from us. <clears throat> in between us and the quasar, there's a very, very, very faint, barely detected galaxy. That's the fuzz you see around the lower blue image, whose gravity is causing the light from the more distant quasar to split into two beams. So when it reaches us, those two beams are at slightly different angles and it shows up as a double image. There's also a time delay between them. The light coming from one of those images is delayed by about one year relative to the other. And they figured that out because quasars are very conveniently slightly variable objects. So they've plotted the time curve of these, brightness curve of these objects, and they find that yes, they really are the same quasar. Not only, not only are their spectra of these two objects identical, anything that happens to one quasar image appears in the other quasar image about a, about a year later. <clears throat> Well, just that the, the two light paths are not the same distance. So like, you know, consider one light path goes straight across, the other one goes up, gets bent by the intervening galaxy, comes back down again. It's a little longer than the other, the other one. <coughs> so that means with this object, you have uh, a number of choices for a challenge object. And I like choices because everybody has different equipment, uh, different skills and different techniques. So next slide. So if you have, say, a small telescope, 46 inches, and you see 3079 itself makes a good challenge object, I use it as the guide galaxy. Uh, if you have, say, 8 to 12 inches of telescope visually, then the companion galaxies are a nice thing to try to look for, because they're on the order of 13th to 14th magnitude. Um, and if you have a larger telescope, say, uh, 20 inches, then visually the double quasar is very challenging. Uh, each component is magnitude 17.1, actually, that's a, that's a typo for a total of about, say, magnitude 16.7. And if you're an imager, because you can take hours of data, lately I've been giving you guys challenges that are just way too easy for the imagers. <laughs> the challenge is try to detect the galaxy that's doing the lensing. Even though it's closer than the quasar, its surface brightness is incredibly low. And I'd really like to see that because the separation of the quasars that you saw in the previous frame are only a few arc seconds. And I know all, all my imagers friends really, really complain when they have to take images at high focal ratios. So there. I am tired of giving you guys easy challenges. <laughs> all right, so thank you. Here's a good This is the final item for, uh, for <coughs> sorry for this evening. This is a uh, photograph by uh, Mike Worths, who's living down in uh, in BC right now. I say down in BC. I mean Baja, California. Right. So this is a wonderful image of his. And what this is showing is on the if you look at the full moon up in the upper left corner, this is the uh, Mare Imbrium down here, the Sea of Rains, and this is the Bay of Rainbows, Sinus Iridum, right here. And we'll throw on a few identifiers. Just a couple of notes, right fast. All right. Uh, there are two promontories here, Laplace and uh, Heraclides. And uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. The, uh, the Montes Jura, the Jura Mountains, going around about six, uh, just over six kilometers high. And the, uh, the one big broad mare, uh, mare area here is separated by the small landmass, if you want to call it that. And it, you get up into uh, the frozen sea, uh, Mare uh, Frigoris right there. Now what we're going to focus on here for the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, for the lunar challenge is the promontory right here. So if we go to the next one, there it is right there. Because there's, the, uh, there's an image of the lunar maiden. All right, now we've got things all twisted around the wrong way, but we'll, we'll fix that in a, in a second here. And if you go to the next one, this is a, a sketch by, as we can see at the bottom, Lucy Whitehouse. And that appeared on the astronomy uh, photo of the day, picture of the day, uh, June 19th, 2003. And there she has the moon maiden. So now we're looking at it, we were looking at it this way before. All right, so the frozen sea is up here. This is uh, the promontory Heraclides. This is Laplace right here, and this is the Bay of Rainbows. This is the maiden. Now she's no, she's no, uh, she's no fetching maiden, let me tell you. All right, here's her mouth and a beaky nose, and here's her eye, and here's her hair streaming back up this way. So now Chris has thrown a couple together here. All right. So this is the idea. It's, uh, this, it depends on the sunlight uh, angle on the promontory to see how close you can get an image if you 
maybe cross your eyes just the right way and find the image of the maiden. So the, the lunar challenge is to observe, if you can, the lunar maiden in uh, Promontorium uh, Heraclides, or just observe and uh, maybe sketch or photograph the area right there. I can guarantee you, uh, from personal experience, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to explore uh, at leisure. I mean, you can go and bang it off in 20 seconds. Yeah, I've done it and check it off on your book. But if you uh, work at a, a range of magnifications, work with a, a wide angle, and then zoom in a little bit, and then pull back again, and uh, you're in for a real treat. All right, so there you go. There's your, your lunar challenge for, uh, for the next month. Our next meeting is going to be uh, August. Uh, is it August next month? Yeah, that's okay. two slides away. Mm -hmm. Oh, two slides away, is it? Well, August 1st. I'll just finish my thought, all right? Uh, okay, here's the... Uh, some of the information if you need to, uh, to contact us. Our attendance, 139 people here uh, this evening, a very, uh, very nice turnout. Now the observatory is closed. <clears throat> I had a number of people asking me about that. Uh, could we turn up the lights here please? We don't need the... Okay, thanks. Yeah, the, obs the observatory is closed. Uh, we're only assigned an educator uh, from the museum. I think it's Tim, what is it, six? Eight. Oh, for, for eight of our 12 meetings. So now, even though there are four of us in this room right now <clears throat> who are authorized to operate the telescope, we don't, have th we don't have clearance to operate the telescope tonight because what they do is they have to have a, one, of the, one of us as a paid educator on duty, so the, uh, the responsibility chain is intact, if you will. So uh, we'll see what we can do about maybe, uh, maybe upping that for the, uh, for the next round. All right, uh, the library will be open. Uh, Estelle Rother is sneaking out the back now. She's sneaking around to open up the observatory, which is just on this wall, right behind this wall, right over over here. What did I say? Observatory. Well, it's an observatory of books. All right. So I'm glad you were listening. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. There's the information. The, probably the key piece of information to pass on right now is that Anne Fraser's waiting outside with coffee, drinks. There are cookies there. Don't take all my sugar cookies, please. All right. So lots of good stuff there. And uh, I, I thought it was a, a great range of presentations uh, this evening. So thanks to all our presenters. Uh, Eric, Richard, thank you very much. All right, happy observing, safe home everybody. Thank you uh, very much to Chris Tarrant at the controls for uh, uh, putting the program together for us.